This is a production of Cornell University. Hello, my name is Courtney Weber. I am the berry breeder at Cornell University. I am an associate professor in the uh, section of horticulture in the School of Integrative Plant Science. Um, I'm talking to you today from inside one of my high tunnels in the raspberry program, raspberries being one of the crops I work on, as well as blackberries and strawberries. Uh, the berry breeding program is one of the original programs here at Cornell Agritech. When the New York State Agricultural Experiment Station opened in 1882, berries were one of the original programs and a strawberry was the first fruit variety ever released from the station in 1894. Um, in that time period, we've released 44 different strawberry varieties, 42 raspberry varieties, and three blackberries. And these varieties are pretty much the mainstay of much of the New York industry and the Northeastern um, industries and upper Midwest as well. And we see our varieties grown from Minnesota to Maine, uh, down uh, south into Maryland, and other regions in the mid-Atlantic states. So they're very popular varieties, very useful to growers, and very widely grown. Some of the varieties have been around for decades, um, going back into the 1930s and 40s, and some varieties have been released in recent years, such as my newer varieties, Dickens Strawberries, Crimson Treasure Raspberry. So we're still doing new variety development um, and still supporting the old varieties that are, that are industry mainstays. Um, as you can see behind me, we have some raspberries growing here on my right. We have blackberries in full bloom behind me. Um, some of, we're in kind of mid-season for that bloom and fruit development period in blackberries and raspberries. Um, we will see our first raspberries. Actually, we saw, have some in the tunnel next door are just ripening. Our first raspberries, we're in the middle of strawberry season right now. Um, and you can see here, we have raspberries that are uh, in full development. They're green, they'll be ripe within a couple of weeks. Um, we see some here on raspberries that will start blooming a little bit later in the season and we'll have fruit into the fall. Uh, so we see berry production in New York from the early part of June, the late part of May, early part of June, through um, December in parts of the state. And with high tunnels that we're, that we're standing under and low tunnels for strawberries, we can really extend that strawberry and raspberry season into different times of the year in New York. Um, so I work on, as I said, three different species, four different species actually, um, but three different crops. So how's that possible? So we have strawberry, of course, that's its own species. And we have summer strawberries, which are ripe now, and then there's day neutral uh, strawberries as well that produce late in the in this season, in the summer and into the fall. Um, in raspberry, we have red raspberry and we have black raspberry, and they are different species. Um, both are native to this part of the world, and so there's a strong tradition of these crops being grown and consumed in this area. Red raspberry then has a, a summer season where you see the fruit developing now. Um, it also has a fall season where we get flowers um, in midsummer and then fruit into the fall. In black raspberry, traditionally it has been a summer season only. Um, and that's one of the things that we are doing is transferring that fall bearing trait from red raspberry into black raspberry. So that will have two seasons for, for black raspberry as well. Um, Blackberry has never been a large part of the program. Uh, the, the winters here tend to be very uh, difficult for blackberries to survive, and we see a lot of winter damage. Uh, we did have a mild winter last year, so you can see we did get very good survival and, and a lot of bloom this year, but some years we see uh, up to 90% cane death in the blackberries and we don't get any summer crop. So towards that end, we're actually uh, working with some of the new material, mostly developed at uh, University of Arkansas, for primate cane or fall-bearing blackberries as well. And so to get uh, fall bearing blackberries that are adapted to New York, that can handle our, our winters uh, as a plant and to handle our summers as well. Oddly enough, blackberries are, tend to be sensitive to high temperatures during bloom. Um, so we're looking for blackberries that will bloom in the warmest part of the year and produce fruit in the fall before it gets cold and, and freezes. Um, so it's a pretty mixed bag when it comes to genetics. We have the black, red and black raspberries are diploid, uh, the blackberries are tetraploid, and the strawberries are octoploid. So we're working in multiple ploidy levels across the different species. Um, some of the technology that we're using in breeding, first of all, was the high tunnels. Um, seems 
to be a fairly simple technology, but it's a tremendous technology when it comes to raspberry and blackberry fruit quality. Um, worldwide, most of the raspberries for fresh consumption that you see in the supermarket are grown under high tunnels, and it's to keep the rain off. We're out here today on a bit misty and windy, rainy day, um, and the plants are dry and the fruit is dry, and we're not getting spread of fungus. So Botrytis, uh, gray mold, is the most common fungus, uh, post-harvest fungus that we see in raspberries, and it really causes a lot of damage to the fruit. And so keeping the fruit dry uh, keeps the fruit from getting infected and increases our shelf life by two, three, four hundred percent. And so we're looking at instead of having shelf life of two to three days for red raspberries, we can see a shelf life of seven to ten days. And so that really makes a huge difference when it comes to marketing. If you're going to grow the fruit in a concentrated area like California for the most part um, and ship them across the country, you've got to have a lot of shelf life. And we see the th same thing in New York. Uh, we have a lot of rainy days in the summertime, and if we want to have good quality uh, locally produced fruit, we need to keep that fruit dry. And so we instituted uh, high tunnels in our program in 2008. We were the, we produce or we set up the first high tunnels here at Agritech. Um, and since then, Agritech has installed more high tunnels to work with cherries, to work with uh, tomatoes, strawberries, other vegetable crops, and now hemp. Um, and so we're seeing uh, high tunnels being recognized as a very important technology uh, for production. And of course, if you're going to produce them in this type of system, you should breed them in this type of system so that they are adapted to this environment. Uh, more recently, we've added low tunnels to the mix for strawberries. So we see the same benefits for tunnels with strawberries um, as we do in high tunnels for raspberries. Keeping the rain off increases the shelf life of the berries, improves the quality. Uh, raspberries are, our strawberries are in um, full harvest right now in New York. And as you can imagine, wet berries don't store very well. And so keeping them dry until the rain passes so that we can harvest them dry really makes a big difference in fruit quality. And so we're breeding varieties under those low tunnels so that they are adapted that, to that environment because the environment is different under these conditions. Um, we see different pest pressure. Um, we see different insects and diseases that can be a problem on the inside under these tunnels than what we see in the field. And so we want to be sure that we know what problems growers might have and how to address them. Um, in the, we also have a lab program where we are working on various aspects of genomics in, in raspberry for the most part. Um, our most uh, recent project has been looking at thornlessness in, in red raspberry and in blackberry. So in red, in red raspberry, black raspberry, and blackberry, in the wild, all the plants have thorns. So the wild type is a thorny or spiny, um, is a spiny cane. But what you see in blackberries is the thorns can be very, very stout. Um, and they will penetrate your skin very easily. They're very, very sharp. We see the same thing in black raspberry. Very sharp thorns, very stout. Often they're a little bit curved um, and they will stick into your skin and penetrate your skin very easily. So it makes harvest very difficult. It makes pruning very difficult. It really makes working with the plants very difficult. Well, in, in blackberry and red raspberry, there have been natural mutants found in the wild that are spine free. And so that has been a big boon to the industry to make spine-free varieties because you can see as I'm handling this cane, I don't have to be very careful. They're not gonna, there's no spines on here to, to cause damage. And this is a blackberry cane without thorns. Um, and so there are natural mutants that we have been using and breeding to produce thornless varieties. And that's really a must, especially in blackberry because they're so, so stout. In black raspberry, unfortunately, we haven't been able to find any natural mutants in the wild, but you can cross black raspberry and red raspberry. And what happens when you cross those two species is you get purple raspberry. And so it takes some generations to get some, some black fruit back out of that. But we've been able to transfer that thornless trait from red raspberry into black raspberry background. And now we have uh, spine-free black raspberry canes. And our next varieties, our newest varieties of black raspberry will be spine-free. Um, we're also transferring that, that trait um, of primocane fruiting into black raspberry. So we hope to have soon uh, black raspberries that are both primocane fruiting, so fall fruiting, and spine-free, as well as spine-free summer fruiting black raspberries. And so that's a pretty important trait. And so what we've been doing as well 
in the lab is examining that at the genetic level to determine what gene is actually causing uh, the spineless trait to come through. And so we used a population that was segregating for this trait. Um, and we examined the, the genome of the progenitor parents and that's offspring and located a, a region um, in the black in the red raspberry genome where this where the single gene for spineless canes uh, resides and we have several candidate genes that we've we've identified that we think uh, one of them is actually the gene involved and so that's where we're at at this stage we've published some of this work um, on that and we're uh, going to continue working on this to see if we can actually use this gene once we find out the exact uh, sequence um, to potentially change some of the varieties that are already out there using gene editing techniques um, into spineless um, or spine-free varieties. And so some varieties that we already know are well adapted and that everybody w already is growing might be a little easier to grow if they don't have spines. And so that's kind of the, some of the stuff that we're looking at into the future for uh, new varieties. So one of the trends we're seeing in raspberry uh, around the world for commercial production is substrate cultures growing the, uh, the plants in bags or in pots uh, to take away some of the variability of soil conditions. Uh, in many places of the world, soils are not really suitable for raspberry, and so to have a more uniform uh, growing environment, we're seeing more substrate culture. So what we see uh, around me and behind me are raspberry seedlings actually in substrate. So we decided a few years ago that if some of the raspberry varieties going to be grown in substrate, we should probably be breeding some varieties for that environment and in that environment. So we've, what we have here are raspberry seedlings in pots. These seedlings, as you can see, some of them are already several feet tall. Some of them are even uh, three or four or five feet tall. Um, and they were started from seed this year. So these plants are all of a couple of months old. Uh, so you can see how fast they grow. Uh, raspberry seed is no bigger than a mustard seed. It's very small, um, but they can produce a very large plant very quickly. Um, about 75% of these plants will produce fruit this year. And so we're, we're able to accelerate the breeding process by putting them in pots and growing them in the greenhouse starting in February and March so that we can have plants in the, in the field in May and actually produce fruit in July, August, um, and through the end of the year. And so this allows us to accelerate the breeding process. We can evaluate fruit very quickly um, from seed. If we were to do this in the open field, it takes at least two years for us to get a mature plant where we can see fruit. So in this case, we've cut off at least a year from the breeding process um, or even more. Because once we have this plant, these plants are very clean in here. They're very low disease incidence. So if we have a, a selection that looks very promising, we can go straight to tissue culture from this plant. Um, and we can start producing plantlets for trials uh, within months of the seed being germinated. Uh, in the field, that's a two or three year process just to get to the point where we might start tissue culture. Um, and it could be four or five years. And so we can cut off multiple years from the breeding process while also uh, developing varieties that might be suitable for substrate culture. And so we have partners in New York, the growers, we partner with the New York State Berry Growers Association, Association to, um, to test potential new varieties around the state, but we also have partners around this, uh, around the U.S. and around the world that also test our new material to see if it's suitable for different areas around the world uh, for commercial production. And so this is one of the things that we instituted a few years. So we can fit about 1,200 seedlings in this one high tunnel, and we can cycle through those seedlings each year. So in a three-year period, um, where we might plant in the field those 3,600 plants, we can go through 3,600 plants here in this high tunnel. Um, in the field, that would take um, about four acres uh, to cover, and in here, we're doing it in about um, a tenth of an acre. And so it really reduces the amount of inputs, uh, reduces the amount of time that we have the plants in the field, and really is increasing our efficiency in moving through the germplasm. Uh, one of the things that also allows us to do is to test for some of the diseases that we see in high tunnels that we don't see in the field very much. And so this environment is very conducive to powdery mildew. It can be a real problem in raspberry. And so we can see powdery mildew susceptibility in that first year in the seedlings and 
eliminate those types of uh, germplasms uh, from our, our program and try to produce varieties that are only resistant to powdery mildew. So you can see here some rat strawberries, so you see our low tunnels. It's a nice rainy day here, so you can see what, why we use them. Keeps the fruit dry, keeps the plants healthy. Uh, you can see in here, the, the, the foliage is beautiful and clean, there's very little disease. You can see the fruit ripening here on the, on the plant. These are seedlings in the breeding program, so these are not varieties. Some of them are uh, pretty impressive and some of them not so impressive, that's typical. Um, we can see some nice fruit coming off here. We're looking for in strawberry, you can see this nice pretty calyx, nice shiny fruit. This one's a little, uh, uh, you can, I don't know if you can see, but the seeds are a little sunken. We don't like that because uh, that makes the skin really easy to bruise. And so that's a trait we look at in particular in strawberry. Um, something that maybe the consumer wouldn't really recognize. We want the seeds and the flesh to be even so that, that uh, you don't. So you can see the juice on my fingers. It just just touching, it's enough to, to damage that fruit. And of course, that won't pack well. It won't ship well. And so that's something we really look at. You can see we want good size. We want big fruit. Everybody likes big fruit. The pickers like big fruit because it fills containers quickly. See a lot of color differences in strawberry. If you look at just these three here. Anything from the deep, deep, deep red to this kind of shiny red to this pale orange color. And this is kind of what we're seeing in the open market is that paler color, um, not much interior flesh color. In the supermarket, that fruit often looks very fresh because of the fluorescent lights. The local consumer um, is more used to a darker colored berry. They see that as something that's a little more ripe, uh, a little fresher. Um, and that's a way we can distinguish our, our local fruit from the, the supermarket wholesale fruit is just by color. Um, often texture as well. Our varieties are generally softer than what you'll find in the supermarket because they don't have to be shipped for seven days. And so we can get away with something that's a little bit softer. It gives a little bit better uh, eating experience where they get a lot more juice in their mouth and consumers really enjoy that fresh uh, local produce that comes right from the field today, maybe the same day in many cases. Um, and you really can't get much better than, that, than a strawberry in June in New York. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.